Good evening, everyone. So, uh, we have amongst us uh, Anuja Chohan, a bestseller writer, author, columnist, copywriter. She has been in the advertising uh, field for a, uh, for a long time uh, and created ads for many multinationals uh, for 17 years before venturing into uh, writing novels. And her debut work, uh, The Zoya Factor, which is also a popular movie, uh, Battle of Bito, Bitora, Those Pricey Thakur Girls, The House That BJ Built, Club You to Death, The Fast and the Dead, upon which we are going to ho host our uh, talk today. So I'm really happy that uh, Anuja Chauhan could make it to uh, Kerala this time because we also have her translated works uh, in more than 60 lang six languages. So at the outset, uh, it might feel awkward, but I would love to know uh, how you started writing and when did you start writing and what made you a writer? Thanks, Raghi, for the introduction. I'm very excited to be here and also quite intimidated because this is an audience that reads a lot and reads across all genres, so that's, you know, a, a little scary for me. Uh, I started writing because I started reading. And I think people who grew up uh, in my generation, my father was in the army, we were posted to many places, and the only uh, outlet we had in a way was reading. So we read a lot of books, we had, uh, uh, we had access to very good libraries, you know. So I guess that's what happens if you read a lot, then you start thinking that maybe you can write a little as well. Uh, because I studied economics and uh, enjoyed writing, advertising seemed like a natural thing to go in for because it's kind of a combination of both, you know. It's a good career for people who, who have those kind of, um, you know, that kind of leaning. And uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I sold um, a lot of food that isn't good for you, junk food. I sold Pepsi, Nestle, Kit Kat, uh, you know, Lay's chips, kurkure, uh, uh, yeah, and the, the lines I did there, I did Ye Dil Mange More for Pepsi, Teda Hai Par Mera Hai for Kurkure, Dar Ke Aage Jeet Hai, Oi Bubbly, uh, Mera Number Kab Aayega, Zor Ka Jhatka Dheere Se Lage, nothing official about it, that was my first Pepsi campaign. So I really enjoyed it, and, uh, but beyond the point, it became like, you know, as a writer, it's all about creative control. I wanted to get to a place where I could write about something more than just the fact that Pepsi is now bubblier or that Kurkure now has Rajma in it and things like that, which is great fun, but a little limiting uh, as compared to what you want to say. And once I started doing that, the floodgates just opened. I just couldn't stop writing. It was so addictive and so exciting to just write. Yeah. Now, uh, this novel is all about uh, an, uh, written in the backdrop of a uh, very, yeah, backdrop of a very famous uh, ritual these days, isn't it? Karma yes. Chaut. It was there in uh, North India, but it has now infiltrated to the South Indian yeah. parts, even in Kerala, because we uh, have seen uh, women hosting Karma Chaut parties. So, uh, how come you thought of connecting uh, Karva Chauth or KC as you call it, yeah. Yeah, uh, which is supposed to be a ritual uh, of, uh, for longevity? And the novel is all about murder, a murder mystery, for whom that uh, KC was supposed to, you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, how, that, how did you come up with that? See, I grew up in a Rajput family. My mother used to keep what we call the KC now, the Karva Chauth fast. And I think my mother and a lot of her friends and sisters genuinely believed that if they broke their Karva Chauth fast and if they ate before the moon rose in the sky, then their husband would die. They really believed this. It is just blind superstition. I'm sorry, that's what I think it is. But, you know, I am no one to judge anyone. And uh, if it's kept with love and uh, you do it for the right reasons out of choice because you want to show you love someone or you want to lose a little weight and feel a little sexier, I don't know, I don't judge. So, um, but it's a very interesting ritual. And also, of course, Bollywood has taken Karva Chot and put all these big... Uh, songs about it and so of course like you correctly said it has infiltrated the south 
and I was just uh, very, I found it very amusing and a little dark, which is the kind of thing I go for when I'm looking for a subject, that a lady fights with her husband and breaks her fast early on purpose and he dies. He gets shot dead that very night. And as a character in the book says, uh, oh, if it was so easy to murder your husband, just break your fast early, then all of us would be widows by now. So uh, I, I just found it an interesting thing to, you look for something to be the lens through which you view society. And so for me, Karvachot fast in Bangalore, in a more rational atmosphere, was that lens I chose for this book. That's why it's called The Fast and the Dead. And how come, uh, you know, so simultaneously plays death and, uh, you know, uh, that, that's, uh, that's what I wanted to know. How, how come you thought of uh, doing uh, a, a detective work in this, you know, in this scenario of Karva Chauth and uh, was there uh, any deliberate reasons of doing that? Yeah, it was that I just, I, like I said, I found it very amusing and interesting and a little dark that uh, a lady breaks a fast and her husband dies. I thought that was a great situation to set up. Like, it would uh, cause people to come and view it and say, see, she murdered him. And uh, all those kinds of things. And uh, see how it works in a very traditional Marwari setting against this much more recent kind of uh, Bangalorean kind of mindset. And look at the fast, both from the points of view of people who believe in it and those who do not believe. I find Indian superstition really interesting. I've also investigated it in The Zoya Factor, which is my book about superstitions about cricket. So uh, I enjoy that. And it gives me a chance to um, put a lot of, um, you know, I mean, a, a lot of irreverent dialogues in the mouths of my characters. <laughs> That's what I try and do. Okay, uh, so it's uh, another question that came up uh, in my mind when I was reading the book. What was the most fun part of writing that work? I, I honestly think that you put your finger on it. I mean, to me, that, uh, that I think it's in the first, second chapter somewhere where this lady decides to break her fast and the amount of food she eats. And then I made a long list of everything she ate. She ate a packet of nipattus. She ate four Krispy Kreme donuts. She ate like a whole packet of non-veg momos. And just for her conscience, she drank a can of Diet Coke. And uh, uh, that was really fun to write. And, and there's a very traditional woman with her who tells her, how could you break your fast? You should go to the bathroom and make yourself vomit. And she's like, I won't. <laughs> and for her, it's such a small thing. But for her, it's such a huge rebellion at that point. You can see that at that point, for that woman, her entire world has gone upside down. Her whole value system has changed. And if you read the book, you also realize why she did it, you know. Uh, so it's, um, I loved what was going on externally that she was eating. And I loved what was going on inside her mind, like, you know, the tumult in her head as in, because she knew stuff we didn't know at that point. So I really enjoyed that. So usually for the new book, you look for something that gets you out of bed and writing. And for me, this thing of the girl breaking the fast and the man dying was that thing. So uh, we also see a lot of uh, feminist characters in these novels, isn't it? Some who are practicing or, and do not confess that they are feminists. And there are some people who confess that, you know, some women confess that they are uh, feminists who are very, uh, you know, uh, uh, very uh, radical in, uh, in certain sense. So uh, it's another twisted question I might uh, confess. But have you thought uh, on lines of uh, creating a detective uh, or a cop or a sleuth who is a woman? Uh, well, ACP Bhavani is very much, uh, comes with his equal, maybe his better half, his partner, Shalini, and they sort of work together. And I like that. Um, I think it's nice to, he's a very feminine sort of character in a sense, you know. I really do believe that everybody has, no matter what your gender, you have a, a like a more female side, you could say, and more what we call a traditionally male side to a persona. And I think ACP Bhavani is quite feminine in, in the sense that he's, uh, he's very gentle. I mean, not all women are gentle, but I'm saying what we traditionally define as the more feminine traits. He's a good listener. He's a, he listens. He's empathetic. He's sympathetic. He keeps quiet. He lets you talk. And he gets things out of you that uh, you weren't prepared to give away. 
So I feel he has that side to him. And also, the interesting part of the novel is that you have actually portrayed uh, the Indian ethos into uh, this work very, very nicely. Uh, you know, the fabric is very, uh, it's woven very nicely. And also, you see this uh, Indian obsession with, uh, uh, you know, uh, religion, Bollywood. And at the same time, you also see that, you know, there are, uh, we, we, you have made it sure that it is also a point of entertainment uh, for the readers. So how could you, you know, how could you uh, weave these complexities uh, of our society into this novel? I think I'm, uh, I'm lucky when I try to attempt this task that our society is very colorful and it is very interesting. <laughs> Even if you sit down to record what goes on in life generally, you'll make for a very entertaining piece that you will have written because I think our society is colorful. Uh, there are lots of contradictions. Uh, there is lots of uh, whispered conversation. There is a lot of loud yelling and uh, it's all contradictory. It's all uh, going in different directions, so to speak. So I just set out to try and make things authentic. Uh, maybe I'm, uh, I'm lucky enough to have the advertising background because it teaches you to be entertaining, you know. Uh, nobody watches a boring ad. So um, my instinct is to make things um, entertaining, you know, so I don't lose my, uh, the people who, are, who have joined me at that point. So that's important. Um, so, so it's that. I find life very colorful and interesting. Uh, I, I eavesdrop a lot, I observe a lot, I strike up conversations with anybody and it's great, you can, you can have a great conversation with anyone. If you just sit down and pay attention and if there's an audience then performers come automatically, you know. It's not like there's a performance so an audience forms, usually there's an audience and someone comes forward to perform. So I think uh, there's that as well. Also in the novel, you see this whole question of Gen Z, uh, especially through the character Spurge. Mm. So how come uh, you c communicate with, you know, this Gen Z kids? Because uh, as, a as a teacher, I am, you know, I have, I'm interacting with a lot of Gen Zs. So how come that I don't want to give any sort of spoilers to the story, but uh, how come you have this communication with the Gen Z, you know, uh, this whole jargons, the, the language, the body language? But Ragi, I have three children, all grown up. I mean, I have three, uh, two Gen Zs and one millennial in my house, 28, 24 and 22. So just watching my irritating children walk around the house and talk to each other gives me that access to Gen Z. Whether I like it or not, they're in my life. Uh, they're loud, they're cricket uh, critical, they're obnoxious, and they don't mince their words at all. I also have access to their friends, and uh, it, it, it's just that. I, my research is usually lazy. I look around for people in my life and try and cast them into books. Uh, I also, I mean, I'm lazy, but I think it's also, um, it's, it's more authentic that way, if your observations come from life, you know, so yeah. My son is always like, I should get paid for this, and you keep putting me in books and stuff. So. Yeah. Then we have a lot of, you know, kinds of women in the novel. Yeah. So could you just explore, uh, you know, the, the ways in which you try to, um, you know, formulate these characters of all these varied, uh, you know, intellectual capabilities, mental capabilities, uh, the class, the caste. So, you know, like for people who haven't read the book or heard about the book, which I'm sure is most of you, thank you for coming anyway. Uh, it's set in a little place in Bangalore, in the heart of the bustling city, in an area called Shivaji Nagar, which I'm sure there's a local equivalent. In Delhi, it would probably be a place like Chandni Chowk. Uh, it's, it's very cosmopolitan. It's got people from all faiths. It's got people from all sorts of backgrounds, all living in this little market street. It's very much a marketplace book. And uh, the characters sort of wrote themselves because um, I, for one, love going to markets and interacting. I love the energy in a marketplace, a sense of magic, you know, that little Arabian Nights kind of vibe, a little bit of that. Uh, the fact that people are fast talking, they're selling you something, you take it home, it might be broken and useless. But while you're there, you're so charmed that you bought it. Uh, all just, 
all the stuff that goes on in a bazaar and what happens in the bazaar after the shops are shut and the lights are off and the people are there in the evening and what do they do and stuff. So that was really the place that I came to it from. And then the characters kind of write themselves because there are people from all sorts of backgrounds. Um, there's a lot of widows in this book, or single women, really. Uh, lots of middle-aged ladies in this book. One is divorced, two are widows, one is supposed to be a self-made widow, <laughs> whatever that means. And uh, it was great fun writing them. Yeah. And also, uh, one of the most important themes that I, th I have uh, come across the novel is uh, uh, the, the problems that is there, and again, uh, the Indian ethos of you know, the binary of Hindu-Muslim sensibilities. And you have beautifully portrayed in the novel uh, how that itself becomes the news headlines mm -hmm. when a certain community is targeted. Yeah. So how, uh, how come you, um, you know, uh, why did you think that this needs to be addressed uh, in a work of, uh, you know, detective uh, inquiry? I, I wasn't, I'm not really investigating anything, Ragi. It is more about... Um, capturing it and putting it down like it is. Um, I didn't set out to write like a Hindu-Muslim uh, romance or, a, you know, in the book, like there's a superstar who happens to be a Muslim who's accused of being a murderer. That's really what happens in the book. But um, for me, it was just that he happens to be... That wasn't the main point of it for me. Um, it was... Uh, I just thought, why does everything, why is everything so politically charged nowadays? You know, otherwise, maybe many years ago, it wouldn't have been that big a deal. It would have been like, okay, this boy is wrongfully accused, and that's it. It's, it would not have been a big deal. It would have just been, you wouldn't have asked me this question, because it would have been quite regular that, uh, that this boy is from this community, this girl's from this community, and he's been charged of a murder. He was at the wrong place at the wrong time. But today, in the, the way the environment is, just the fact that the boy is Muslim becomes like a huge thing, and he's completely villainized and stuff. And we've seen it happen very recently, you know, with uh, anything to do with Bollywood gets super sensationalized, and anything to do with Bollywood plus a person from a certain community becomes even a bigger circus. And uh, that all clouds the eye of the investigator because he doesn't know whether he should believe the newspapers or he should believe, listen into people's prejudices and see how much of those are real and valid and how much of those are just in people's heads. So it was, again, just trying to be authentic. You, uh, I felt that authenticity, right? And also I was wondering how you could, uh, you know, uh, seriously think about uh, the mental health of women when it comes to the character of Jayashree or uh, the mad woman, so-called mad woman, yeah, uh, who is charged of, uh, you know, who, um, the murder in the beginning. So how do you, I mean, uh, do you link it with the society, uh, the insanity that is uh, being, you know, uh, even if it is pathological in case of Jayashree? How do you think that uh, you know, the society views women and insanity in general and in particular to the characters in the novel? No, there's definitely a sense in our society that if a woman is alone and she's alone by choice, then she must be mad. If she's alone by choice, happily alone by choice, this woman is insane. There's this thought that jhalli yogi pagal, you know, she's like, this woman is off. There is that. There's a definite sense. It's dangerous. Uh, a woman like that is dangerous is because she's alone and she's satisfied. It's disconcerting because we're all supposed to be in two neat little, you know, like pairings. It, the Yashraj thing of Bhagwan ne hum ko jodiyon mein banaya, like whatever is that. So the fact that a woman is alone, unhinged and being loud and irresponsible and not giving a shit, it's scary for people. It is. And... Uh, um, I don't see why it should be, and I'm seeing in the woman a person like Jeshri or a person like Dondi Pai sort of leaning into that. Intimidating. Intimidating. It's intimidating that oh, she's so loud and she has no, you know, she doesn't give a damn. And uh, it's scary for people. And um, uh, that naturally, that kind of woman is threatening. She needs to be put in a place. She should be shut down and probably accused of murder. And uh, so that you can say, see, there was no man in her life. She went mad. 
it, it sort of holds. It's kind of like a lot of things that happen with someone like Kangana Ranaut, for example. I'm not saying that I'm taking up for her of everything she says is justified, but whenever there's someone who's a loud mouth, who's a loose cannon, and who talks a lot, and there seems to be no man in her life, there is this notion is that woman has been unhinged by rejection by the male species. Addicted. Ha, kuch ho gaya, na yeah, kuch ho, yeah. yeah. And also, uh, you know, since a year or so in Kerala, uh, there is this huge ruckus on uh, this topic of stray dogs, yeah. recently at least. So people, we have these divided groups, one who, like, uh, you know, the Pali party who, you know, uh, support or they want to take care of the stray dogs and some people uh, like Sushi who are into, you know, this strong opinion to kill dogs. And I have, uh, when I went through your, you know, we have, the, uh, we do this internet researching. Uh, you are a lover of animal as far as I know, because you have, you know, you, you have, you're part of a lot of uh, uh, animal rescue systems. So how come uh, that in this novel, stray dogs become, a, you know, a, a many, uh, they, they become, actually witnesses of many important things that happen in the novel. So, is that your love for animal or was that uh, you really wanted to craft animals or stray dogs into the novel? No, actually the reason the stray dogs and the book is somebody says it, I think Bhavani only says it, he says that um, stray dogs are a polarizing subject because they have no concept of human hierarchies. They tend to bark loudly at billionaires and grovel before beggars. And that is very disconcerting for people because stray dogs decide who they like. They don't care, or any dogs, you know, or, or, or probably stray dogs, is that they don't understand who is important, who is not important, who is rich, who should be sucked up to and cowed out to, and who should be, uh, you know, insulted and ignored. So their, uh, their system is very different. And uh, that's what I feel that we, we need that. We need a little more of the stray dog way of uh, evaluating who's worth your time, you know. So I put that in for that reason, that uh, this is, it's a very weak group of people. I mean, stray dogs, well, they're not people. I'm just saying it's a very, um, it's a group which is um, not very strong at all. And uh, there are, so, so there's a kind of a metaphor there, I suppose, maybe, for people who are on the wrong side of stuff without, I love dogs, which is why I even say something like this. But uh, I'm a reasonable person on this topic, and I do think that we have some very humane and good laws, but nobody's following them as far as strays are concerned. So as long as there was a lot of, if people did the vaccination and they did the neuter neutering, we would have a small, stable, socialized population of stray dogs, but nobody does that. So it's. So, uh, I know it just dawned upon me that you were talking that Bhavani Singh is, uh, you know, feminine in nature in many ways. Mm. Uh, I had this thought uh, of being, you know, the masculine and the feminine dichotomy, or even the intermingling in the character of Peter Pies. But eventually, when I read, then this thought comes to me that no, Peter Pius is like any other regular man yeah. who is sick of taking uh, care of uh, his mother. But again, I was thinking, no, I'm not right because even women, you know, who are entitled to take care of their parents or their, uh, you know, parents in law, yeah. you know, uh, so uh, this is not, uh, you don't have this, uh, you don't need this dialogue. Be it a man or a woman, yeah. you get tired of taking, uh, you know, taking uh, care of people, be it their mother or even daughters, but we never acknowledge that because it's considered as immoral. So yeah. That's so true. And I think Peter Pius is actually the person with the mental health issues in the book, more than his mother or anyone else, because this is a man who hasn't a achieved, you know, inverted commas, much in life. And his claim to fame is that he looks after his mother. He's a good son. And for him, that is the thing, it's his identity, and yet his identity is crushing him entirely because people only know him for that. Saying Peter Pius is a good son, he looks after his mother. If you take that away from him, he has no other way of standing out. And though he's hating it and suffocating it because of it, that is his identity. Because his sisters are very successful, and they have other things that they can say about themselves. But this is his one thing, and it's killing him, but he can't give it up. So uh, he's actually the one who's struggling the most with these issues and uh, I don't think it's right for us to have this expectation of uh, someone being the sole caregiver or putting in a sense you put someone on a pedestal and 
that pedestal becomes a trap and they can't step off it and just be a regular person and say, no, bro, I can't look after my dad all the time or my mom. It's not, I'm, you know, like we do this a lot to daughters-in-law uh, and other people, we say that you are the caregiver, you do everything, you are a Devi, for example, you know. There's that whole Devi thing and then if you're a Devi, then you can't act irresponsible, you can't get a day off, Devis don't get days off, you sit there on your pedestal and you do what we tell you and we'll do the ghanta on you every day and you're trapped forever. So, in a sense, he's in that sort of position in the book. Uh, you were also talking about the marketplace and how marketplace becomes a character in this novel, as far as I know. Although it's not very prominent, we, uh, this is all about gullies. Yeah. It's all about gullies. So what about, you know, this <coughs> gully culture, which is so prominent in India, but varied in sense? Yeah, well, but the best thing about India and Indian gullies is we are so intimate. We are in each other's faces all the time. This whole concept of space in India is highly alien. You know, we're like very alien for us. What is space? Why do you need space? I'm sitting here. My, If you go on a bus or on the metro or wherever, somebody's elbows in your mouth practically, right? You are inhaling someone else's armpit. And that level of familiarity only in India you get. Yeah, People are like, dhar, like jammed together. And there's no avoiding it. Uh, you don't want that intimacy, but whether you like it or not, it's there. When people fight, the whole mall knows they fought because everybody heard them. And now we're being polite and we're pretending we didn't hear, but we heard. Uh, so they're very crowded spaces. Uh, there's a lot of uh, involuntary <laughs> intimacy that you can't get away from, um, which is very comforting in a way and scary if you lose. And no matter how you how much you go, like Heather is now a movie star, he lives in Bombay, he has so much, he, his mother has a much fancier house that she doesn't want to live in because she likes the gully so much, you know, so there is, uh, that's it, I mean, look at this festival, it's amazingly crowded and that's why I'm here, that's why we're all here because there's the energy of, <laughs> of that, so that's what I like about the market and the gully and, and just the energy of people meeting, uh, interacting, whether they like it or not. And, uh, that is also precisely the reason that we have a long list of suspects because they are so, you know, uh, so close together. And my uh, next, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something that ignited something inside me when I uh, say that when you look at the characters of the novel, they are uh, mutually dependent in one sense and also detached in other sense, even in the close quarters uh, of their homes. Uh, what do you think about it? Is it, uh, there must be some reason, isn't it, that we are attached at the same time and we are detached on some other levels. Uh, have you thought and thought uh, those lines or did you? Yeah, uh, well, it's uh, a list of suspects and it has to be, um, it's tricky. This is a tricky part of writing a whodunit, is that you have to leave enough clues so that at the ending uh, the reader doesn't feel cheated and says that she withheld some information and I would have guessed it if she hadn't hidden that. So you have to hide a little and you have to show a little. It's the ultimate striptease, you know. You're dancing with fans over all the vital places and you're moving the fans around but you don't want everyone to know but at the same time you want them to feel at the ending that damn, I should have got it and I didn't. So there's... Uh, it's tricky to do that. And uh, like you said, yeah, the people in the book are interconnected. Uh, I can't, not all the connections are visible when, you, when you're reading and you go along. There's a lot of stuff that you still don't know. But at the ending, you have to feel that, well, I could have figured that out if I thought hard enough. And I think that's a tricky part of uh, the writing of books like this in the genre. Yeah, so part being a uh, detective novel, it is also a love story, yeah. isn't it? Love sto many love stories, actually. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I'm also wondering the kind of sisterhood that you see in the story, right? Huh. Although they suspect each other at some level, you see a lot of sisterhood in it. Mm. And at last, something uh, related to the motherhood as well. Mm. So, uh, do you think that even if the adverse things happened, between them, they would stick their gun together. That, that's what my question is. If they, no, they would, uh, they would be uh, for uh, each other, even if 
you know the most adverse things might have if might have happened to them if one of them you know did something harmful well i don't want to like over idealize it you know I, it's not like we are all in the gully by choice and we just love the fact that this person's elbow is in my nose i mean a lot of it is it also familiarity also breeds a lot of you know resentment and contempt and all these other things so yeah people are very tightly bound but not necessarily everybody loves each other will defend each other uh because that's just unrealistic it's probably not true that people would have you know i mean i think we are all responsible people at the end of the day if you knew someone committed a murder then you would probably uh come forth with that information i'm sure yeah so uh, another uh, thing is how do you uh, in in the terms of craft how is it different from your other novels not from the readers perspective but you know from from, a, the, writers, from the writers yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's a, in a way it's similar and in a way it's different i love writing romance i'm trying very hard all my myself to create a genre which i have named rom crom so that's romance plus crime plus comedy so i've written five rom coms and now i'm trying frantically to make rom croms happen um and i think that the, what is similar between a romance and a murder is like how when there's a romance you don't know what the other person's thinking and it's always a game right you don't know if they feel what you're feeling you don't know the state of their heart and what they want and what can what is it is the commitment is it just some kind of a you know like a like a hook up kind of a space is this person going to break your heart is this person going to kill you well not kill you physically but you know break your heart which is pretty devastating so there's that and when when it's a murder mystery again you don't know anybody's state of mind you don't know what's in anybody's heart or or what they're thinking or what they're planning and stuff so that th that kind of a thing is similar but of course there's much more mathematics in a crime novel because you you have to show a little then you have to hide a little and you know what happened but you can't say it so there's a lot more structure there's a lot more scaffolding under this there's a lot more bones under the skin but if you look at it on the surface it looks similar but there's much more going on below i think uh and also there are these complexities as you told that you know you can on, cannot always love the person uh, whom you love yeah uh, yeah so uh, the relationship between krish and uh, hadi how do you uh, ne, that that's a beautiful bromance that i've seen but at the same time i think there is a huge rivalry going between yeah. you know yeah. so it's not i mean uh, it was i asked this you because i was touching about uh, sisterhood yeah. but there is this whole different chemistry when two men come together yeah. Yeah. how do you uh, think that it would uh, help in crafting you know future stories because when a woman writes she only writes about you know most of the time she writes about the psyche of women but here i think you have really touched upon uh, the the intricacies that could have you know that could happen potentially between men well i think that um, psyches are psyches i don't really get into the male female angle of it but yeah well um, i really enjoyed writing uh, krish and hadi's relationship because these are best friends and always krish has been the the, the richer one the more handsome one uh, the one who has the cool parties and how these kind of like is you know he plays the guitar while krish sings and he's more of the follower and krish is more the leader and now today look around and how these the one who's a movie star and krish is the one who's kind of like fading a little and uh, is getting feeling that you know that whole trope of the popular kids never really do anything in their lives he's following a little of that trajectory of being a high school jock who really went nowhere so um i found again that that that's fairly realistic i've seen that uh, in places and tried to capture it but again there are no winners or losers in friendships you know and uh, there's so many laps in every game and who knows what may happen with hadi tomorrow and what may happen with krish tomorrow and i like that at the end of the day it's a blunt relationship and they express what they feel uh, earlier maybe i felt for me this was a very gen z relationship uh, or a millennial relationship because men earlier perhaps did not communicate this well with their best friends or they wouldn't even call them a best friend right but uh, i feel these guys um they communicate much better they talk very bluntly they say they call out shit 
uh, which a lot of older men of uh, older friendships may not do that at that age. They may do it in the 60s, they might say, bro, why you did this when we were 22? But when they're 22, they may not call it out. But these boys are very much, it's, it's an honest relationship. And um, I thought Krish was a great character and a great suspect and I enjoyed writing that, yeah. And also, uh, I wanted to tell you that most of your works uh, feel like movies. So, uh, let me tell you the audience that uh, this uh, particular book, The Fast and the Dead, is also being adapted to a movie which will be released in February in Netflix, right? Yeah, no, there's, uh, so The Fast and the Dead is a sequel to Club You to Death, which was my first murder mystery featuring ACP Bhavani, and that is going to be a Netflix film. It's been shot, it's almost ready. Pankaj Tripathi plays ACP Bhavani. Uh, and he's lovely, it's a great casting. And there's a big uh, ensemble cast with Sara Ali Khan and Vijay Verma and Dimple Kapadia and Karishma Kapoor and Tiska Chopra, Sanjay Kapoor. It's a big cast directed by Homi Ajanya. So then if the murder, it's called Murder Mubarak and it's out on Netflix, uh, I think in the first quarter of the year. So, if that one does well, then yeah, ACP Bhavani will hunt again and we'll see a movie made out of the fast and the dead. <laughs> yeah. The uh, fast uh, and the dead, uh, you know, it itself uh, encompasses this uh, uh, dichotomy. And I also am intrigued by the oxymoron of yeah. uh, the movie, Murder Mubarak. Yeah. So, uh, how, there's was a very that nice, your suggestion? No, no, but there's a very nice line because I saw the film, now I'll paraphrase it, I'll say it badly. I think it'll be in the trailer as well. He says something, it's Pankaj Tripathi talking, it's ACP Bhavani talking to himself and he says, look at all these people and uh, I feel I'm in the middle of a festival of death and somewhere in the crowd, someone is silently congratulating himself and saying murder Mubarak. You know, so he's silently congratulating himself on a successfully accomplished murder, which is why it's called Murder Mubarak. Yeah. So, and therefore, I guess if they had sequels, they would just say Murder Mubarak, new season or whatever. So, when you craft your novels, uh, what kind of uh, read? I know that we need to communi communicate with every reader, but while you write something, who are those readers that are in your mind? Okay, this is tricky because uh, um, I think it's very important not to have a sense of audience when you write. You know, like if I'm typing on my laptop or you're typing on your laptop and I come and I stand behind you and I start reading what you're writing, you'll put your screen down. You'll be like, hey, don't do that. Nah, don't, don't read when I'm writing. Makes me conscious. Makes everyone conscious. So if you start thinking with a sense of audience, then you won't write. It'll paralyze you. Or you'll write rubbish. Or you'll get into this whole crowd-pleasing tactic you know, uh, which is really not very good at all. Or, so I don't write with an audience in mind, but I do have a small band of trusted readers whose opinions matter to me, whose feedback matters to me. Uh, there's my children all grown up now and they've read everything I've written. So I get very blunt, solid feedback from them. There's my husband also, very solid feedback. Uh, and a couple of old friends and fellow writers and my, you know, people who I send the manuscript to for feedback. And because I've worked in advertising, I think, I mean, of course, I could be just delusional, but I think I'm good with feedback. Because in advertising, you get, people are so ruthless. Matlab, sida juta marte, rubbish, throw it away. Fit se likke lao, sad goes, you know, like, so I've had a lot of that happen that to me in various uh, boardrooms at uh, Pepsi and, uh, you know, Nestle and uh, places like that. So I'm, so I'm good with feedback. I take it, I don't feel victimized. I don't feel like it's a personal attack. Even if I feel it's a personal attack, after I've shouted and screamed for a couple of days, I calm down and I read it. And the good part is that it doesn't cost anything. Like if I'd made a movie and you gave me bad feedback, reshooting it would be a nightmare. I mean, the amount of money and logistics involved. The good part about a book is that, well, hey, just delete, rewrite. It's easy. It's in your control. That's the best thing about writing books. They are totally in your control. Your name goes on the title, but that is because it's only you. So you have to, you know, be good about feedback and focus on putting out the best thing. So, uh, so this is essentially a cosmopolitan work in that sense, isn't it? 
because you are communicating with a lot of you know varied uh, audience and also at the same time cosmopolitanism as far as i understand is also about yourself mm. and the connections that you have to forge for yourself so mm. how do you see this work as a cosmopolitan work if it is so i don't know man for me it's Oh, that's not really a word uh, for me. Cosmopolitan is a cocktail or a magazine. I don't know, but I, I try to be Indian. I, my books are set; they're very desi books. They're set very much in the Indian ethos, in different, different little slivers and little, little, you know, zoom ins within Indian society. So. I think society everywhere is cosmopolitan at the end of the day. If that means universal, for me, universal is a good word because it's a story that could work anywhere because people are the same everywhere, you know, really. So I'm just going for that. And if it ends up being cosmopolitan in appeal, then that's a good thing, I guess. Another interesting part in the novel is you have represented all classes from Saraswati to Sona. So how do you think that it is important uh, into the weaving of the novel? Because every gen everyone gets suspected, isn't mm -hmm. it? Expect, uh, expect for, uh, no, except for uh, these two characters, you know, Saraswati and Bhagya Lakshmi. Mm -hmm. So how do you think that this is a thing in, in our culture that, you know, we have this co-living, we have uh, uh, in a gully, as mm -hmm. again, you know, uh, this uh, uh, very lower class people to the most elitist upper, ca upper class people. And the, also there is this direct connection between uh, the lower caste and the uh, lower class and the upper class, even if they are, uh, you know, homemates. Mm. And they, part, uh, they, they play a very important part. And how middle class intervenes in between uh, through the character of Charu. So how do you see this, you know, this, this conversations and these interactions between all these classes? But isn't that how it happens? That's how it happens, right? These are your inner circle. People who work in your house, who are cooking for you and cleaning for you are the most intimate, closest people in your circle. These are people in your circle. You meet them every day, you talk to them, your relationships with them are super intimate. You know, so uh, Saraswati and Bhagya Lakshmi are very much, in fact, that's why the, the policeman, he says, he says, these two girls named for goddesses are very shady. These sisters are 100% they're up to something, you know, so um, he, people are just, it, it, these are just people in your life and everybody's equally important. And uh, you ask anyone, I mean, Bhagya Lakshmi would be much more important to Sona than a lot of other people in that house because uh, she's a massive part of her day and she's an important person with her own world and her own cares and everything. So again, it's just about observing and giving people the importance um, that that is theirs. So oh, the dynamics of uh, father and son uh, in the novel is so relevant uh, to the, uh, you know, to the detective story or the major plot of the novel. So, uh, have you uh, ever thought that what if uh, it was uh, the, the, you know, if, if, if they, I mean, it's, it's a supposition question actually. What if, if there, were, uh, there was a, a doctor in between them, you know? What would have that relationship, with, uh, relationship between Sushil and that maybe a doctor that he had? Do you think that uh, the, the, uh, the whole dynamics would have changed? I think Sushil is just a horrible person. So I don't think he'd have been any nicer to his daughter than he was to his daughter-in-law or to his wife. Uh, I, he's not nice to anybody, really, is he? I, he's not nice to his sons either. Um, it, it's just a sort of a sadistic, unpleasant sort of soul. Maybe a daughter would have had a softening impact, but I doubt it. I just think he was a bit of an ass. He is. So uh, again, uh what is the world that you envision? It is, uh, is it like, you know, the Habba Gali? Is it that? The world that you love to, uh, you know, have around. Is it, uh, you know, is, the, is Habba Gali a microcosm of the world that you envision? I think it's true for all of us, right? Like we have uh, some lovely crowded places that we love to go to. 
there'll be whether it's, it's a shopping place or it's a, you know flea market or it's a mall or it's a little party or it's a place where you go to after work or it is your little huddle in your workplace everybody has a habba gali in their life you know habba in kannada means um, festival it's called festival street and uh, i think we all have those spaces uh, we have our quiet places and we have our crowded places where we go to get energy and we go to shop for life and meet people and have interactions you know like you come to a lit fest and you meet people and it's great to do that uh, and then after that you go away to a quiet place and you write your book but a lot of your book will carry the energy that you picked up from the crowded place so i think we all need that and i'm sure we all have that in our life you know we'll say like are let's go to help a hell there'll be some action there'll be some energy some shit will go down you you need that crowded space as well as you need the quiet place and you need the balance of both so habagali is clearly that place for me in this book for sure <laughs> yeah then how comfortable are you uh, being called as a popular ri- a fiction writer ah uh, well i think being popular is a good thing i was popular in school and it was good to be popular uh, from what i can tell and uh, nowadays in the, you know in the uh, literally even popular movies are also considered good it's only popular books that seem to for some reason have a shady angle to them i'm insecure enough to love being popular um i'm a little uh, snooty and a little proud about my readership and my readers because i think i have incredible readers and uh, the, the, the things they pick out and how well some you know, so many of my readers are doing so well there was this one particular batch of girls who i met in 2012 i went to their college you know lady shri ram college in delhi university and I, spoke to these girls and it was a spilling room there were so many of them and all those girls still write to me they're doing so well today they've become like foreign service officers and they're doing so well in multinationals they're filmmakers they're working in ngos so many of those girls doing so well and i feel really proud that uh, those kind of people like my books so that's a big thing for me for sure Can we open uh, the session for uh, yeah, interaction? Yeah, sure. I'll be happy to have questions if anyone yeah. has. <laughs> so we would like to invite uh, your comments, questions, or even uh, you know your views. If you have read the book, please do. Or even if you've not read the book, that's fine. <laughs> Hi, ma'am. I hope you're enjoying Kerala, and what a wonderful session. So, I just want to ask you that I've only read uh, the house that BJ built. This is my second book. Um, so, I want to ask, like uh, you said, uh, you do take inspiration from people around you, and house that BJ built has a lot of characters that we can relate to. They're full of flaws as well. So, have any of them actually, uh, any of the people in your life, have they actually read the book and said, "Yeah, you have written about me." and how did you deal with that yeah I, i think that you have to be a little clever you have to disguise them you know so like uh, like a really uh, uh, there was a, a really horrible lady in my office who was uh, the terror when we were all very young and she ended up being like a, a pakistani general in baz you know so i don't think she'd have recognized herself because she's <laughs> she's playing a very a character very different from what she is so i think that you what you try and do is that you grab traits or a, a little ticks of speech and you change something and mix it up a little so nobody catches you of course you might still get caught sometimes but you have to be a little clever don't just like copy paste you can't do that you copy then you do some mixing and chipping chapping then you pace don't uh, you have to be clever like that but honestly i mean i would recommend it uh, because i really feel that observations from life are the best
Do we have more questions or even comments? Yeah, we have one. Hello, ma'am. Uh, I haven't read this book, but I've read uh, Zoya, Zoya Factor, and my question is about that only. Um, it was a very uh, refreshing book uh, to start with. It had cricket, uh, lots of drama, and uh, very fun book. But when it uh, became a movie, um, what was your role? Like, uh, how did you um, take part in the screenplay of it? Because uh, I think as far as the commercials was concerned, uh, the book was a bigger hit than the movie, right? So, um, what went wrong there, like, uh, from the translation part? Um, okay, I, I didn't really have a role as such uh, in the Zoya Factor film. They did ask me to write a couple of scenes, which I did. Uh, and I think those were appreciated. But um, it's a whole different ball game. That is why I live in Bangalore and I write books. Because I have complete creative control. Uh, a movie, there's so many stakeholders. You know, there is a studio, there is a director, there are screenwriters, there is one star, one more star. Everyone, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's hard, you know, for a single creative vision to work in that setting unless that person is really empowered um, and I realized that that kind of creative control absolute control I only get in books which is why I prefer writing books and as you can see you know writing for a living only novels doesn't pay so well so I'm always very happy when Bollywood shows up at my door I do a nice aarti for them and I put a little tikka and I say take it make it give me the money and uh, which is fine, but I do say to my readers that you want to see my vision, please read the book because uh, the movie is certainly not my my vision. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have other questions? Okay, uh, one last remark uh, on, on your work. Uh, do you plan to have sequels to this work? Because Bhavani Singh is very interesting. And maybe we can see a Watson uh, along with him and it would have been, you know, much more interesting read. Do, can we expect something like that? Or uh, you can just tell me about your future. I mean, uh, if any other line of book is coming up. Well, I do have several ideas for, you know, for a sequel, uh, for more ACP Bhavani outings. But it really depends, I guess, uh, also on how well the film does, practically speaking. Because if it does well and it's a popular character, then it would make sense to write a couple more. Or uh, right now I'm in a very open state of mind. I think that there is endless possibilities and endless settings for murders in India. Uh, all kinds of motives and all kinds of uh, suspects are out there. It's a gorgeous, rich, um, you know, area to be writing in and writing about. So, I'll see how it goes. I'll see how the film does and, and I'm all for it. So, I guess I just have to wait. Yeah. So, any closing remarks that you want to pass to the readers? Oh. No, just a general vote for thanks. Thank you so much for coming. And um, I'm really enjoying being in uh, Calicut. <laughs> and looking forward to the evening. So, thank you. That's all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anuja, for we had a very pleasant chat, very vibrant chat. Thank, thank you. Raghi, thank you, you so much. Great. Thank you, Raghi. You were great. <laughs>